Um, my name is Jaden Start, and welcome to my talk. I'm here to talk to you about HAVOC, which stands for High Altitude Visual Orientation Control. And this is a project that's focused on creating systems for stabilizing balloon payloads so we can collect better visual data like videos or photographs. In this presentation, I'm going to be introducing you to our current HAVOC system, showing you its hardware, and then presenting some data from its first flight trials. So let's see if I can actually get the slides to move. I think I'm having an issue. It's on Zoom. Let me move to PowerPoint. There we go. OK, so um, another introduction. Again, my name is Jaden Stark. I am a junior at the University of Alabama Huntsville. And I'm studying for a degree in aerospace engineering. So just a little bit of context. I'm not a meteorologist. I'm not an electrical engineer. I'm just a simple aerospace engineer who happens to work on balloon payloads. So uh, keep that in mind. And I'm the founder and leader of Project Havoc. I'd also like to introduce you to the Havoc team. We are a group of about eight students from UAH, mostly engineering students. And almost all of us, including myself, have been working on Havoc since our freshman year as undergraduates. So this project means a lot to us. You can see us on the right. Um, some of the fun that we've had working together is um, kind of it's kind of a bonding experience. I, I really like the people we work with, and we've had a lot of fun um, working on Havoc. And like Bill Brown was mentioning, um, this project is a part of the UAH Space Hardware Club. And so I've already talked about it a little bit, but the UAH Space Hardware Club is a student-run organization that facilitates engineering projects like Havoc. We receive funding from the Alabama Space Grant Consortium and have multiple lab spaces on the UAH campus where we do our work. Um, the Space Hallware Club has multiple balloon projects like Havoc, but we also have a rocketry program and an autosat program that focuses on robotics and autonomous vehicles like rovers. So let's get to the problem. Um, weather balloon payloads are unstable during a flight and they tend to spin rapidly about the balloon line. This is something we know about and just kind of deal with, but it makes collecting video pretty difficult. On the right, you can see some unedited video of a balloon, a video captured from a balloon payload and see that it's all over the place. There's not much you can do with that. Using video editing, we can diminish the shakiness of the video, but if our camera rotates outside of the range of some target we're trying to film, there's not much we can really do about that. There are many passive approaches that we can use to reduce payload rotation. We can put swiveling joints on the balloon line to try and decouple the payload from the rotation of the balloon line, and we can make better payload bodies to reduce rotation. But there's one big problem with these methods is that they cannot guarantee a specific payload or instrument orientation. We can't guarantee that the payload will be facing a fixed heading. And this can be a problem for collecting aerial video. So here's our solution. We need methods of active stabilization that can reduce payload rotation, but also deliver a desired orientation. With this in mind, we need to realize that a system of active stabilization being used on a balloon payload needs to be capable of operating in the conditions of a high altitude balloon flight, like low temperatures and a thinning atmosphere as the balloon ascends. And so Havoc, our solution is a system of cold gas thrusters that can control payload rotation and deliver a desired payload orientation. So um, first, I want to talk a little bit about cold gas thrusters for those who might not be familiar with the term. This is a type of rocket propulsion that does not use combustion. Instead, it just uses the expansion of some pressurized inert gas like air or nitrogen. These thrusters are very simple, and they're commonly found on the attitude control systems of spacecraft. On the right here, you can see some examples. Um, the top picture is a thruster that's firing on the descending stage of a Falcon 9 booster. 
And at the bottom, you can see astronaut Ed White holding a handheld maneuvering unit that uses a series of cold gas thrusters to let an astronaut maneuver during an EVA. So we can see that cold gas thruster systems operate in low pressure environments and low temperatures. So they should be effective for our use on a balloon flight. So Havoc has designed and built a payload body equipped with a series of thrusters powered by compressed air to control the attitude of a balloon payload. So here's the basic control theory of the Havoc thruster system. We use a onboard series of sensors to measure the rotation of the payload. And then we can fire thrusters to apply torque to rotate the payload about the balloon line in a desired orientation. So here you can see we have two thrusters, a pair that's firing to make the payload move in a clockwise motion. And the opposite could be true by firing a second set of thrusters to induce an anti-clockwise motion of the payload. So now I'm going to introduce you to the current design of our payload body. This is the current cold gas Havoc payload. It has two pairs of color coordinated nozzles that can produce either a clockwise or counterclockwise rotation about the axes of a balloon line. And they're placed at the ends of large lever or arms to increase their torque output on the payload. So now we can see more detailed view of the cross section of the payload. So yeah, this is an annotated cross-sectional view of the payload. The components are stacked vertically to accommodate for the gas tank that supplies air to the thruster system, as well as to keep the payload's center of mass kind of centered about the axes of rotation. On top of the payload, there's room for electronics and cameras. It's currently occupied by our current electronics package design, but there's room to accommodate much more. And so, yeah, this is a basic overview of some of the hardware, which we'll go into more detail later. Here's another view of the CADS models of the pneumatic system with some funny dimensions that my software decided to convert from metric to inches. So they're not very pretty, but the basis is that we have these lever arms, which are one meter long, that just turned into 39.37 inches somehow. Um, and a quite a kind of beefy air tank at the bottom. And I can move to a better view here. So this is a detailed schematic of the Havoc pneumatic system. All of the part numbers reference the descriptions in the bottom left table. And I'll start from the left and work my way to the right, um, talking about the flow of the gas in the system. Part number one is our gas supply, that's our tank and it holds air at a pressure of 4,500 PSI. That has its own regulator that reduces that tank pressure down to 900 PSI. That's part number two. Part number three is our adjustable regulator. We take our 900 PSI, reduce that down to 100, and that's the operating pressure of the system. Part four is a junction that goes to part five, which is our safety vent which will open and vent gas if the system exceeds 110 PSI. Part six and onward, the flow junctions into two solenoid valves. These are electronically actuated valves that control the flow of gas independently to our clockwise and counterclockwise thruster sets, which are color coordinated here. Note that the pairs of thrusters are paired in their tubing, so you could fire two at the same time. You can't control all four independently. This is fine for our use case because they work in tandem with each other to deliver a clockwise or counterclockwise torque, and it reduces the complexity of the system. So yeah, all of the um, part numbers and all the references are in the bottom left table. Our thrusters, the nozzles themselves are custom 3D prints that we've designed. Since our combustion, well, since we don't have any combustion for our propulsion, we use a simple diverging nozzle that chokes the flow by reducing the exit area. And at sea level, operating at our 100 PSI operating pressure, these have a force output of about half a pound. And these thrusters, of course, are paired with each other to produce torque 
And at the end of their lever arms, which place them about a half a meter away from the payload on either side, um, deliver considerable torque to the payload, which increases as it ascends, as the outside pressure diminishes, they become more effective. Our gas supply is a carbon fiber reinforced aluminum paintball tank. These are tanks intended for use in paintball guns and accessories. And the carbon fiber reinforcement means that they use less aluminum metal, making them lighter. And they're also considered stronger than normal aluminum tanks. They store air at a very high pressure, uh, 4,500 PSI in our case. And what's most important is that they're designed for safe, safety and ease of use. Both of these points were very important to us. When dealing with high pressure air, we decided to work with dependable consumer products rather than designing our own hardware for safety reasons. These tanks also come in many different sizes and follow a common connection standard. So designing our payload with this in mind means we can easily upgrade or replace our gas supply if we want to. In our case, our tank holds 50 cubic inches of air at 4,500 PSI. Its full mass is 1,009 1 grams, so about a, so a kilogram. And it holds 210 grams of air. This is the smallest model we could purchase. There are many uh, larger versions of this tank that we could upgrade to very easily in the future. And so now I have a video demonstration of the payload. What you're going to see is um, first, let me get the video to load just so we have that. I hope it comes through good on the Zoom call. Sometimes they don't. First, we're going to see a control run of the payload. It's strung from a balloon line on a swivel joint. And we're going to spin it with the thruster system turned off so you can see how the payload behaves. So we'll show that right now. So this is, with, this is the payload right here on a balloon line hung from a ceiling. And we're going to give it a good spin and see how it goes. So as you can see, the payload spins. That's what you would expect. Um, there's no active stabilization at this point. But with the system turned on, we get a different response. So you can see that the thrusters resist the rotation of the payload. Um, it actually stops the payload from making a complete revolution, um, which is excellent compared to the control where it can just freely spin however it pleases. So having successfully built and tested this payload, the next step for us was to fly it. So let's see if I can go. So our first flight. We flew the Havoc payload for the first time on April 11th. The purpose of this flight was to test the payload's ability to reduce rate of rotation. Specifically, we defined that the payload should not exceed a rate of rotation of 40 degrees per second with the stabilization system active. At this point, we were not trying to maintain a fixed payload heading, but rather limit the rate of spin and collect data on the system's performance. So. We're just worried about the rate at which it's spinning. We're not quite worried about the heading quite yet. And so for this flight, the payload was programmed to activate stabilization at an altitude of 15 kilometers. This was done so we could collect data on the payload's rotation with stabilization turned off. And so we could have enough control data to compare to the system's rotation when it was turned on. One of the problems we encountered was the failure of our camera systems. All of the pictures here were taken from a 360 degree GoPro camera that was placed above the Havoc payload. Uh, this camera failed prior to the beginning of the stabilization at 15 kilometers, along with a camera that was placed on the payload itself. Despite that, data was still collected for the entire duration of the flight. Stabilization began at 15 kilometers, 39 minutes, 23 seconds into the flight, with a total flight time of one hour, 49 minutes, 15 seconds. So now let's look at the data. 
Here is data from the April flight. These figures show altitude versus rate of rotation for the ascent and descent of the payload flight. The blue data points show the rotation of the payload with the stabilization system turned off. The orange data is the rotation of the payload with the stabilization active. The red lines mark our 40 degree per second target threshold. So let's start with the ascending data on the left. We see the payload's rotation increase as it approaches 15 kilometers. Uh, this was expected as the payload would cross through the upper level tropospheric jet. Um, we see the rotation peak at around 80 to 100 degrees per second at this point. At 15 kilometers, the system turns on and we see a distinct change in the rotation of the payload. The rate of rotation is very quickly reduced below the 40 degree per second threshold. And the orange data points stay within the red lines for the remainder of the ascending flight. Here, my slide's frozen, there it is. Um, uh, this is the outcome we wanted. We wanted to see a sharp drop in the rotation after the system turned on. And that's what we see here. We see that orange column of data within our red lines. So now we can move on to the descent on the right after the balloon burst. Um, so the balloon line begins to fall. We were not quite sure how the system would perform during the descent. Uh, we were unsure if the balloon line in free fall would result in the system depleting its gas supply as the payload tries to stabilize and the thrusters become ineffective. Um, what we see is that the payload stays primarily within the 40 degree per second threshold during the descent. Upon landing and recovery, we found that the payload had excess pr propellant. It had not run out of propellant during the flight and was attempting to stabilize while on the ground. From this, we conclude that the system was active during the descent, did not run out of gas, and this contributed to its stability as the system was never programmed to turn off after it had ascended above 15 kilometers. So with that in mind, that gives us a total duration of the stabilization. It lasted one hour, nine minutes and 52 seconds. So some discussion. We see that the Havoc payload demonstrated its ability to reduce payload rotation below a set threshold for almost the entire duration of a balloon flight. We believe that we could reduce this rotation below 40 degrees per second based on the performance we saw on this flight. So changing that number, I think we could see a much um, tighter threshold achieved. More testing is going to be needed though to implement our orientation control, specifically better code. We want to have a system that's able to resist its rotation enough to where it can achieve a fixed heading such that if we have a high field of view camera, we could keep a target in view. And that target can be arbitrary. It can be based on magnetometer data or anything really that we feed to it. Um, and future flights will use improved cameras. Um, we've worked on insulating our cameras. We believe our failures were due to temperature and that should not occur in the future. Seeing as the purpose of this project is to collect video, we're gonna put better cameras on our payload <laughs> in the future. And so now, uh, what's the future for Havoc? Uh, what's in the cards for us? Well, I'm happy to say that Havoc has been accepted to present at the 72nd International Astronautical Congress, which is being held in Dubai this October. We submitted an abstract and have been approved to submit a paper and give a presentation at the conference. Myself and a few members of the Havoc team plan to travel to this event and present our work in person to an international audience. Um, we will continue to develop and test the cold gas payload working towards that orientation um, fixed heading control that I mentioned. And work has already started on a new payload body that uses wing control surfaces to control rotation. Um, this payload was, has been built. It was turned on for the first time yesterday. Me and Todd went into the lab and we're working on this payload. So that's coming soon. That will fly with our cold gas system sometime this month, if not this coming Tuesday. So after this uh, conference, that's what I'll probably be working on is this payload that you see in the bottom right. So um, thank you. I said the, this talk would be kind of short, but um, my email is here. 
Uh, again, my name is Jaden Stark, and the website for the UAH Space Hardware Club is here too. Um, the Havoc Project also has a new YouTube channel. Um, the link is there, and I can put it in the chat because it's kind of ugly, but if you search Havoc Balloon, you'll find our channel. It only has one video up right now, but we plan to post a lot more in the future. So, uh, no, thank you all for listening to me. Um, I'm open for discussion if anybody has questions, comments, and concerns. Excellent uh, work, uh, Jaden, and I look forward to your future uh, flight tests. And, oh, yes, uh, sir. So you think you've got uh, at least an hour, hour and a half worth of uh, coal gas uh, capability in the system? Operating at 40 degrees per second threshold, at least in the weather conditions we were in, yes, we believe if we were to activate at the ground, we would have lasted because when we made contact with the payload, um, it was in a tree. It was hanging from that tree, but as it was in that tree, we could observe the gas thrusters were firing to try and stop it from exceeding that rate of rotation. And it did that for quite a long time. So we believe it operated in excess of two hours. Um, it took us a while to make contact with it. So we, were, we didn't know what to expect. We thought temperature would hurt us. Um, we thought we'd lose a lot of pressure as temperature decreased. And so that would reduce our capacity. Because um, something like this on this scale we didn't have any data to go off of. And so, no, it worked pretty well. We thought the free fall would overwhelm it, that it would be firing and it would quickly just fully deplete all of it. But uh, no, it, it didn't. And we were surprised. So that's good for us. That means that when we start doing the more stringent orientation control, it's going to be more demanding and that we're confident that we can get a pretty um, long duration out of it, longer than we expected. Did you now, uh, perhaps I will. Uh, go ahead, though. <laughs> All right, um, Jaden, did you perhaps try a test where you uh, just literally opened up your thrusters and let them run just to see how long that tank lasted in worst case scenario where you're just blasting for the entire flight? We did, and it can open for about four minutes. And oh, it will. Okay, so really? Okay. Yeah, and so it's firing in bursts is what it does. Um, the solenoid valves are only open or closed. It's either full or not. And so we pulse it to try and achieve a variable input. And so five minutes of on time, we were concerned that once the free fall happened, it would have just fully opened. It would have been crazy. But that's not what we saw in our yeah, data. I was, I was really impressed that during the fall, it, it was that stable. That was really nice. Yes. And I'll also note that during most of the ascent before it turned on, it was below the 40 degrees per second. It wasn't until it really started getting close to 10 kilometers that it started spinning. We, we flew on a really nice day. Um, but we believe that this system in the not so nice conditions could do some work and stabilize payload rotation. So now, I've, I found that uh, just having styrofoam balls on the end of, I had uh, uh, one meter on either side uh, you know, carbon fiber pole, it really stabilizes the payload a lot. Uh, Edge of Space Sciences, I believe they use about uh, half a meter on either side on their camera payloads. Uh, but having a little drag uh, elements on either side, which your nozzles are, that's going to help a lot. So how many, uh, how quick are the bursts? Uh, we have a, the minimum burst time we can do is 20 milliseconds. That just has to do with the response time of the solenoid valves. Um, that's part of the hardest part are the valves. Um, you know, they're these big solenoid valves. They require 12 volts and they uh, high current draw. And so our system had to deal with that because we're operating at 100 PSI. We could reduce that. In fact, we think it's a little overkill. Our ground testing revealed that the system was too strong. And on the day of flight, I think we reduced it down to about 70 PSI that we have an adjustable regulator. And so we just, we key it down with like an Allen wrench and we can reduce it because it was really strong. Uh, the half a pound of thrust per nozzle plus the lever arm 
meant that at sea level it was performing quite well and we imagined that it would get out of control it would be overwhelming itself overcorrecting and we it still did that we we need to account for that in our calculations and so what we're going to do is we're going to do a little bit more math as we ascend and change our burst time based on the reducing pressure because our nozzles become more effective um, now uh we did a flight for a solar eclipse uh, in California about 20 years ago, uh, more than that, 25 years ago. And so what we did was we had a two light sensors separated by a black panel mm -hmm. so that it would always point at the sun. Uh, if they were both eliminated, that was our goal. And if it was outside one way or the other, the fin was behind uh, the control sensor, the light sensor and it would steer the fin and the back whichever way it needed to go to go back to having both of the light sensors eliminated by the sun the goal was to always point at the sun during the eclipse and it actually worked pretty well uh, we had because uh, you're actually flying up you know? yes and of course as you get into thinner air it's not going to be as effective uh, but we also had a little design flaw and uh, now we're studying a solar eclipse. What do you think the design flaw was? Not pointing at it. We lost our our light source during the uh, eclipse. Well, yep, yep, <laughs> that, that'll do it. Um, <laughs> so at the moment you needed it, it's gone. Uh, and that's actually, you bring up the eclipse, and um, from what we see, there's going to be two North American kind of uh, eclipses in the future. There's a 2023 event, and then there's a 2024 totality. And we, we're designing the system with that in mind. We really do want it to be capable of keeping a target in view, and we think an eclipse is a good test. Um, so absolutely, we have the eclipse idea in mind, and so we'll develop hardware for detecting and making sure our line of sight is kept. Um, the biggest thing for us is that you can do a lot of post-processing with video. You can stabilize it. You can zoom in on a portion and try and keep that portion level. But if your camera system is making multiple revolutions, you can't do anything about that. The 360 camera is really good for that because it solves that issue. But the issue is that even though it's got a big resolution and it captures this huge video, and when you look at a small portion of it, the resolution is not that great. They're also expensive, and we usually don't like doing that. Um, and with this, we also want to implement a gimbaled system. You can get a little better camera control with a gimbal, similar to what you'd put on a drone. The issue is that a lot of those are not meant for continuous rotation. If the payload keeps spinning and it keeps wanting to keep a fixed heading, they, they get wound up, and they don't like that. Um, and some have a maximum control. Well, they all do, but some have a very low maximum controllable rate of rotation. So if a payload's spinning 100 degrees per second, um, it might not keep up with that. And so having something else to keep that payload within the rough position, um, it makes the gimbals work much easier. Then it almost becomes like a drone um, in that sense. Yeah, you're, you're platforms kind of steady and then you have a little bit of finer camera control then you're golden so that's what we intend to do is we want to implement a camera gimbal system in combination with this or our fin design which you can see like you were saying the balloons going up and so we use that downward relative wind and these flaps um to uh produce rotation and that we we test this in the lab for the first time i've got to tune my pid control a little better but uh it, it was working. Todd was in there with me, and it was interesting. We had a fan set up, and we had it strung up to the ceiling, and it was switching directions. It was it was trying. It's just a little jerky at the moment. We uh, had a about 25 years ago. There, Chuck Christ, uh, W9 IHS, had a uh, project called Wind Tracks, and he would took a about a one foot disc and punched holes about one inch holes in it. And put it on the end of a uh, of a pipe of a like a carbon fiber rod, mm -hmm. probably uh, maybe a meter, half meter from the payload, and just having that drag disc out there helped keep the payload from spinning. Uh, so 
you can work with uh, active and passive systems to to help with the stabilization. Yes, sir. I want to mention that because um, you can see in this data for most of the flight, it's pretty stable during the ascending portion. It didn't spin excessively. And what you were saying about having the balls on the end and about half a meter, that's what we've done. We've encased our nozzles in mm -hmm. these spheres and they sit far out. And we think that's going to passively help what we're doing. And of right. course, our thrust acts along that same arc. So um, we think we have a good system. We, I, we're going to probably fly a dummy payload um, to try and compare get some data on the passive improvement. So on the same balloon line, have a payload without some of the stability stuff, um, without the thrusters too, just to have a control. Um, one of the biggest issues we have right now is our electronics is that uh, there's chip shortages and getting some mm -hmm. of the components are specifically our orientation sensors. It's difficult. Um, they're just not in stock. I don't know when they'll be in stock. And so I'm trying to hoard all the ones I have right now. Um, because, of course, we're part of a big club. There's a club, multiple projects, and so there's an officer board, and all the projects co collaborate, and they all try and order stuff. And so you have to kind of fight for your project as far as funding and sometimes parts. Uh, I have all the orientation sensors. It's all mine. You know, it's <laughs> I'm hoarding them. How much does the whole thing weigh? The whole thing weighs a little over five pounds, which is up there for the FAA requirements, but it's below the six per pound maximum for FAA ex at 101 exemption. That's full though. It reduces in mass as it flies, which is kind of an interesting concept. Um, mm -hmm. As far as predictions, it loses 200 grams of mass. Um, it's pretty heavy, but we're working on making it lighter because this is really a prototype. Um, there's a lot of 3D printing nonsense that could be reduced. Um, we're looking for better, lighter solenoid valves. Those are some of the heaviest parts of these big valves. And um, trying to maybe consolidate our pressure regulators into having one instead of two. But with the paintball tanks, the manufacturer installs the tank regulator, and we have to put one on top of that. We haven't gone in and tried to replace that regulator ourselves. That's something we haven't dabbled with. So we could we could shave off a lot of weight from this prototype, I think. But I was going to make a comment on two things. Uh, one thing for your camera, what you yes. might do is just a real quick and dirty solution is put a um, the um, heaters foot the little hand heaters. Yeah. Start one up about an hour before flight. Slap that back on the back of the camera. So you can keep it warm enough. And I found that that keeps it probably about degrees warmer throughout the flight. So that's a kind of a quick and dirty solution you might try. Yes, sir. And that's the solution we're probably going to implement. Okay. So the 360 degree camera, that's Todd's camera. Since this April flight, flight, he's flown it again and had it work for the entire duration of a flight after insulating it and using warmers and such. So okay. we know that that works. And okay. the actual payload system camera, we're swapping that out. We were using Raspberry Pi cameras. That was our cheap solution, but I'll be mounting a proper GoPro um, on the payload. Then I'll have to insulate that and heat it. Second, the slow down rotation on my packages, I will put uh, four lines that come down from the parachute, the parachute ring, the parachute. Mm -hmm. Having four lines rather than a central line, you don't have that central pivot point. Yes. Limit you to spinning about as fast as the, as the balloon, which is not quite so. So you don't end up spinning like the top below the balloon. Yes. Our main issue with that was that although we don't spin, we have an issue if we're trying to orient ourselves. So let's say we're facing the wrong way and now we want to spin, we're kind of locked. And that's part of the thing with the passive approaches. There's plenty of ways to try and stop the rotation, but your orientation becomes an issue. Um, so this is just one solution. I think it's kind of an overkill type thing to put thrusters on a balloon payload personally, but that's what we've done and we've had a lot of fun with it. One of the biggest parts of the project is the education and the student involvement. Um, we're a group of students and we've been working on this for a while. Um, it's something we're passionate about and um, we've had a real fun time doing it. So we're gonna continue doing it for a while. I'd like to point out um, some experimentation that maybe in the future you might wanna look into. Um, uh, I worked with a group in DC that did a control moment gyro system, mm -hmm. and we were really focused on getting really precision control of more upper altitude. 
And we built a prototype that worked in the lab. Unfortunately, it didn't work in the air. Um, but it was based on, there's a BETTII balloon experiment that a couple of universities did. And they were doing um, twin telescope interferometry. And they required a really stable platform. And that allowed them to do that. And this would allow you to do things like really precise control for a directional antenna and mm -hmm. download lots of cool stuff and do all sorts of uh, imaging and so on. So just another thought for you. Yes, sir. And that's what you said. There's a lot of stuff you can do when you have a stable balloon platform. Um, that's the thing. There's um, It opens up some new um, avenues um, or just helps pre-existing um, experiment and data collection like the eclipse it you want to film high altitude video of an eclipse but if you're not looking at the eclipse or if the eclipse is in the frame every like five frames um of the video camera that's not good so uh, something like this um, we're excited to test out in more applied applications one of our ideas also was line of sight tracking assuming that there's a target but that target might be moving if there's some sort of beacon some sort of signal that it can hone in on Theoretically, it could adjust that target orientation, even if the target's moving. Because, of course, the balloon is moving across the ground laterally, but, you know, you could theoretically keep pointed at something um, as you move around it or it moves. So filming other flight hardware, maybe keeping line of sight with other balloon payloads, it's, it, we think it's possible. Um, if you were to fly multiple of these and they were to make sure they were pointed at each other at some distance, or at least oriented in their same direction, um, uh, we think it's possible. So that, yeah, we, we plan to do a lot more of this. Um, we got really set back because of COVID. Uh, we received most of our parts in the spring of 2019. Um, so we lost lab access. And so we were on a hiatus for a good semester and a half out of our two years of really working. So. Um, now we've done a lot. We really came back and we flew in April and that was huge and we're going to fly again soon. So oh, I'm excited to do more. Well, we, of that. Did it by we did it by accident. Uh, Jaden uh, at a GPSL uh, multi-launch where we launched 10 balloons at once in St. Louis and two of our payloads were 200 feet apart at 53,000 oh, wow. feet and one took a photograph of the other. That's really and, cool. So, yeah, uh, so that's Images like that, I think, would be really neat to be able to capture stuff like that. Um, I'll, I'll put that slide back in my presentation and just share it. <laughs> yeah, that's neat. Yeah, you'll, so, find yeah, and, um, on, you'll find that picture on my website if you look at the report on PSL 2015. Mm -hmm. It was 2015, wasn't it? Yeah. 2015, that's right, yeah. We did a flight where we put wings on the thing to stabilize it, and it ended up working too good but it was really hard to control the you know the pid controller and it got to a point where it was very jittery because it was yes. over overreacting all the time so yep. and i think it changed as the flight went obviously as the air changes so it's a rather complex algorithm to get that to be stable it is and so currently mine's jittery um at the moment the way i'm testing it i turned it on for the first time yesterday i've been building it it took two weeks to build it. So I put it together in two weeks and designed it and modeled it. And um, so we'll be working on that more. I have a guy, I'm part of the team. He's a big controls guy. He's a big programmer. And so I'm kind of second in command as far as programming. He's the main guy. And so he'll be coming in probably tomorrow to start tuning this thing. Um, yeah, the, the problem we had was we got bored with it because the only place you could test it was on a flight because of the pressure changes. Yeah, you can't. It's hard no. to simulate um, or impossible nearly unless you really had some huge, nice. crazy rig. Yeah, nice big vacuum chamber. Huge vacuum chamber. Yeah, currently we have a fan set up that try and produces the right. yeah. breeze. Um, and that's all we got. And that's um might be what we have to live with. Um, and we'll, we'll have to see, you know, if it's calibrated at sea level and it rises, we'll see that change as it gets worse, I'm sure, as it starts yeah. and, overcorrecting. And next time you compensate for that and Hopefully you get it right eventually. Yep. What I think though is for the thruster system, it's a little easier to wrap your head around because um, the equations are easier. We have a set thrust and we can calculate that thrust because we know our 
our mass flow, we'll know our exit diameter and we'll know the outside pressure and we can we could reasonably calculate our force as that changes throughout the flight. And so with our calculations, we have, you know, a force constant and if that constant is no longer a constant, it changes throughout the flight. Then that's, it makes it a little easier. Yeah, one of the things we discovered was a camera with a microphone on it was interesting because you hear the servos moving. Yes, the servos are loud and the thrusters are loud too. In the video, you could hear that air come out. Yeah. Um, Currently, it's compressed air, but you could also use nitrogen. But I, because we use paintball tanks, and those are kind of a hobbyist type thing, you'll go on these forums, and there are people arguing about them. Because for my application, I don't care about what most paintball players care about when looking at these tanks. But of course, I had to research them extensively. And so, oh, people have all sorts of crazy. I, I would guess the pump to fill it is rather expensive. It's forty five hundred pounds. So it's it's five it's four thousand five hundred. Four thousand, yeah. So it's um, near impossible to get a imp compressor for it, at least a safe one that we could reasonably use. So we have to get them filled from bulk tanks. Um, <laughs> but you don't get many fills from a bulk tank because you're filling at forty five hundred psi, and once you're below that point, I'm not getting a full fill anymore. And that's what these tanks are supposed to operate at. They are meant for forty five hundred psi. Um, I mean, they could operate below that, and we don't need that, but that's, we want the full capacity out of our tank. Yep. So, no, it is, so, it's, yeah. So would it be better to have this carbon dioxide, since that's a, a molecule that's, you know, 44 uh, grams per mole, to more mass, greater density versus air, which is, you know, 80, 80% nitrogen, having that more, more mass, you know, more denser air, give you more mass flow, uh, would carbon dioxide be a better reaction gas? So we studied that. Um, we had did our, an initial test using liquid CO2 as a propellant. And so they sell silver cartridges of liquid CO2. And we did a small scale test. And um, you're right, um, the, the, the higher molar mass does make it more dense. It makes it a better gas, I guess, in that sense. But it was really complicated to work with um, designing a system to accept liquid CO2 because the tanks are metal. They're thicker than the carbon fiber ones that we have, they're heavier. Um, filling the liquid CO2, procuring that's kind of an issue. And one of the biggest things is that temperature affects it drastically. Um, at colder temperatures, that liquid CO2, getting it, you have a huge pressure fluctuation. Your system's constantly in, in having problems. And plus, as it moves, it sloshes around. If it's upside down, it actually spews liquid CO2. And that that's an issue. Um, and that's what brought me to the paintball thing because paintball players use liquid CO2 and this compressed air stuff in the past 20 years has become better because of all of those problems people have found with liquid CO2. And so these tanks are more on the higher end of the hobby, but people are like, hey, use compressed air or nitrogen. It actually has some advantages um, over liquid CO2 as far as dependability and such. But in our application, the compressed air works well um it was a little overkill with our force we need to tune it down anyway and it lasted for the entire duration of our flight basically um or it could we believe it could so yeah we we, we did look at liquid co2 or just co2 in general and um we just kind of went to compressed air we were like it's not worth the trouble <laughs> um i just want to make a small suggestion suggestion yep. um so for my balloon flight, um, I used Raspberry Pi cameras, uh, a Raspberry Pi camera, and that uh, has proven to work pretty well. Um, the only problem I had was that it turned off mid-flight. Probably the SD card came out. That's exactly right. what we did. We used a Raspberry Pi camera, and it turned off mid-flight. So that's what we did on the April flight. That's precisely what we've used. You can even see in the 3D print here. I'll show you. That mount, that plastic mount on the clip that says camera mount, that's sized for a Raspberry Pi camera. It sticks out and the ribbon cable goes in. So that's that's a good suggestion. That's what we originally used as our payload camera. Um, but yeah, it gave up on us mid-flight, and I have no idea if it was the SD card or if it was the temperature. Mm, okay. So it, yeah, you're right. Um, many people have used Raspberry Pi cameras. I think they're fine. Um, there's plenty of options um, out there for them, plenty of little accessories, um, and they're yeah. very small. 
the the on another uh, downside of the Pi cameras that I found was that it didn't have a high aperture. So so I had a little like a uh, character um on a stick. Now we had to decide whether to focus the background or the character. Yes. So yeah, if you have something in the foreground, yeah, you're not you're gonna miss everything behind it. Um, thankfully for us, we shoot these big wide shots of a horizon. We try to keep anything out of our foreground, like the payload arms and such. So we don't have a focus issue with that. Um, my 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 issue is um a couple of things. One, we it turned off on us. I don't like that. I don't like using the Raspberry Pi as much as I would like to have a independent camera system. And also I think they're really fragile. The ribbon cable connectors. I've had it, I've had tons of issues. I've I've broken Raspberry Pi Zeros, the ribbon cable plastic tab, it just comes off. Oh yeah. Um while I was working on my payload, the first revision, I was like like unplugging and replugging in the Pi camera of the yes. span of a few days. And then it just completely came off. I had to like, yes, like, hot, like a tons of hot glue on it. And that's what we did. That's what we've done. Uh, that's that's exactly the situation we've had. I think that, and I've read up about it, and this is a common issue. So it's uh, when you use Raspberry Pi cameras, uh, it's yeah. There's there's some uh, yeah for my issues. next. For my next fight, I'm planning to do two more things. Um, one is try to get the SD card more in so that it doesn't come out because that's what we're sp suspecting what the issue is for the flight. But also um, having uh, the HQ camera high quality, quality. Um, I th we're thinking that that would have a higher aperture. Yeah. And putting hot glue on the ribbon connector. Yeah, even when we have working connectors, we've gotten to a habit of just doing that. So we have the connector permanently in, and it's just like, okay, so if you want to connect a camera, connect it to the ribbon cable. Don't touch the Pi. It's already in there. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, you, you bring that up, and that you're correct. Uh, Pi cameras uh, have some issues. I'm, I'm looking into um, smaller cameras that are used on drones or that are used on, uh, some people use these cameras for RC planes. Um, mm -hmm. They're like an independent separate system. Um, I don't want to really have to do a ton of programming for it. I really just kind of want to drop it in and have it work. So GoPro is good for that, but GoPros are big and they're a little heavy for what they are. Yeah, plus it's not as fun as DIY cameras. Oh, sure. Well, we, we had fun on the Raspberry Pi camera. When it stopped, when we broke the connector the day before launch and had to swap it out, that was that was fun. <laughs> so that's what we had.